Order, order. The clerk will now proceed to read the title of the private bill set down for consideration this day. Second reading, Transport for London Bill, Lords. Second reading what day? Tuesday, the 29th of April. Tuesday, the 29th of April. Thank you. Order. Questions to the Secretary of State for Foreign and Commonwealth Affairs. Mr Graham Stringer. Number one, Mr Speaker. Foreign Secretary. With permission, Mr Speaker, I will answer questions 1, 8 and 12 together. We are gravely concerned about the situation in Crimea and in the east of Ukraine, where armed groups seized government buildings in Donetsk, Kharkiv and Lugansk. There can be no justification for this action which bears all the hallmarks of a Russian strategy to destabilize Ukraine. Russia should be clear that the deliberate escalation of this crisis will bring serious political and economic consequences. Mr Graham Stringer. In February, Mr Speaker, the Chancellor of the Exchequer offered financial assistance to the Ukraine. At the start of this month, Gazprom put up the price of gas to the Ukraine. What safeguards can the uh, Foreign Secretary tell the House he has to stop any aid we give to the Ukraine going straight to Russia via increased gas prices? Um, well, as the Honourable Member knows, the, the aid that he's speaking of is the uh, IMF programme. What goes on on the IMF uh, programme? The Ukrainian government have been discussing the first stage of that with the IMF. Um, and in order to obtain that, Ukraine will have to meet the conditions set by the IMF, including how that money is used. But, of course, uh, Ukraine would enjoy a more successful and prosperous future if Russia would join the rest of the international community in supporting the economic future of Ukraine. Mr. Simon Burns. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, following the praise of UKIP on Russian-controlled television yesterday, would my right honourable friend uh, remind the House of the guiding principles of British foreign policy towards the Ukraine, namely that the Ukraine has a democratic right to self-determination and that sending in the tanks and holding a sham um, referendum in the Crimea um, under the shadow of a Kalashnikov is not only aggression, but it is illegal in international law and a threat to security of the world. Well, my honourable friend makes a very important point, and for us the guiding principles here are that the development of democratic institutions in Ukraine is in our national interest and that a rules-based international system uh, is in the national interest of the United Kingdom. And I think for any uh, parties or leaders in Britain to feed a Russian propaganda machine after the invasion uh, of a neighbouring country is not a responsible position to take, uh, in particular for, some, for anyone who professes to believe in the independence and sovereignty of nations. Kevin Brennan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the authorisation President Putin obtained in February to use troops in Ukraine did not specify that it applied to Crimea only. What is our policy in the, in, in the event of such a Sudeten-like land grab in eastern Ukraine? Uh, the Honourable Member is quite right, and that was, of course, one of the most alarming aspects of the authority that uh, President Putin uh, asked for in February, that it covered the, the use of armed force uh, in Ukraine in general. Uh, as he knows, the European Union and the United States have imposed certain sanctions, but the, the European Commission has been asked by the European Council to draw up further far-reaching measures, uh, economic uh, and other sanctions to be implemented in the event of a further escalation and intensification of the crisis by Russia. Any invasion of eastern Ukraine, of course, falls into that category. Gamble. I appreciate it's not within my right honourable friend's gift, but in the event that the situation deteriorates materially, would he at least support the notion that Parliament may have to be recalled? But when talking to other foreign ministers in the European Union, has my right honourable friend emphasised the importance of a concerted and determined approach to these issues, and that any sign of disunity or lack of commitment would undoubtedly be exploited by Moscow? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, on the first point, of course, we, Parliament must always be able to uh, deliberate urgently, although I've always taken the view that... Um, 
before Parliament's gone into recess is too early to call for it to be recalled. Um, but uh, I take my right honourable friend's um, point um, about that. Um, I absolutely agree with his uh, second point, and I emphasise this at the meeting of EU foreign ministers I attended in Athens over the weekend, uh, that the strength and unity of the European Union on this issue uh, will be a vital determinant of the ultimate outcome. Straw. Mr. Speaker, whilst giving full support to the uh, Foreign Secretary's strategy on Ukraine, does he accept that the more that the Ukrainian government can reach out to the Russian speaking, speakers in eastern Ukraine, the less excuse will President Putin have for taking provocative action there? Um, yes, I, I think this is an extremely important point, and it's one that I have uh, emphasised in over the last couple of weeks, both to Prime Minister Yatsenyuk of Ukraine uh, and to uh, Foreign Minister Deshitsia. Uh, this is something we say constantly to the Ukrainian authorities, uh, that it is very important that the government in Kiev shows it is representing all the um, uh, regions of the country, and that it is, of course, important to discuss decentralization uh, in Ukraine, uh, while not necessarily accepting an agenda of Federal of paralysis by federalism, which is proposed by Russia. Peter Tapsell. While all historical analogies tend to be misleading, can it be borne in mind that if we're looking back to the 1930s, as I think we're fully entitled to do, that the occupation uh, of the Crimea and Sebastopol bears more resemblance to the Anschluss than to the invasion of Sudetenland? but that if the Russians were actually to invade the Ukraine, that, of course, would be an act of naked aggression. Um, well, I, I think there was a good deal of naked aggression in what happened in Crimea, um, as well as, in, of, of course, uh, my right honourable friend is right about the great seriousness of any further encroachment into Ukraine. So I think that is something we should bear in mind, as well as his point that historical analogies can always be misleading. Douglas Alexander. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. As the Foreign Secretary's earlier answers indicate, the protests across the east of Ukraine in cities, including Donetsk, highlight the very real continued risk of violent escalation and for further bloodshed in Ukraine. In his first answer, the Foreign Secretary spoke of the recent events bearing all the hallmarks of Russian involvement. Would he be willing to set out for the House a little more detail as to what he judges the form of involvement of Russia has taken in recent days? Um, well, I said it had the hallmarks of a Russian strategy to destabilise uh, Ukraine. I think this is something that we have to expect in the run-up to Ukrainian presidential elections on the 25th of May. It would be consistent uh, with Russia's strategy and behaviour over recent weeks to try to damage the credibility of those elections, to take actions that would make it uh, appear less credible to hold the elections in eastern parts uh, of Ukraine, and to make it more difficult for Ukraine to operate as a democratic state. And th th those hallmarks are, there, are all present in what has happened in recent days. Mr. Douglas Alexander. Mr. Speaker, I note and welcome the Foreign Secretary's answer. The Prime Minister said in his statement on Ukraine to this House on the 26th of March, and I quote directly, the international community remains ready to intensify sanctions if Russia continues to escalate this situation. In light of the Foreign Secretary's answer, and if reports of Russian involvement in eastern Ukraine do prove correct, does he believe this would constitute grounds for widening the economic and diplomatic pressure on President Putin? Um, well, that will depend, I think, on the uh, course of events over the coming days and on evidence of uh, Russia's involvement. The, the latest this morning is that the authorities in Kiev say that this situation is dangerous, as, as we have said in this House, but is under control, and indeed the um, administrative buildings in Kharkiv now appear to be uh, un back under the control of the Ukrainian authorities. So I think we will have to uh, assess the situation over the coming days, but I say again that a deliberate escalation of the situation uh, by Russia will bring serious political and economic consequences. Dr. Julian Lewis. To what extent has the ability of our European allies to wage effective economic sanctions against Russia been undermined by their dependence on Russian gas sources? 
And do we have a strategy for trying to persuade our allies to diversify their energy sources so that this dependence will be lessened in the future? Um, well, I think the answer is that it hasn't affected what we have done so far, but we have to be very conscious uh, of this point and the effect that it could have. And we are very active, uh, both I at meetings of foreign ministers, the Prime Minister at the European Council as well, we are very active in saying that it will be necessary to accelerate measures that reduce Europe's dependence uh, on Russian gas. Uh, the G7 leaders discussed this at some length at the meeting in The Hague two weeks ago. And he will be aware that we are convening in the G7 a meeting of energy ministers precisely to discuss this ahead of the G7 heads of government meetings. Mr. Inlavery. Question number two, sir. Minister of State. Mr. Speaker, TTIP is our top trade policy priority, worth up to £10 billion a year for the United Kingdom. The EU-US summit two weeks ago re-emphasised political support for that agreement and our ambition remains to conclude the deal next year with the fifth negotiating round due to take place next month. Thank you very much. Thanks for that uh, answer. But can the Minister say if the Government will use the options open to, to Member States that exclude public services and most importantly the NHS from the scope of the TTIP agreement? Mr. Of State. Um, the, the Prime Minister has already made very clear that uh, part of our negotiating objective is going to be to make sure that when it comes to health services, um, the provisions or any provisions included in TTIP are broadly in line with our existing uh, obligations under GATT. So we don't envisage that there would be any significant change in the current position. Mr. Ottaway. Interestingly, does the Minister agree there is a read across between Ukraine and TTIP, with some seeing TTIP as an economic NATO? Binding the EU and the US together more is bound to have political and geostrategic implications, and TTIP can become a symbol of Atlantic solidarity, which may well check Russian imperialism. I, I agree with my honourable friend about the symbolic as well as the practical economic importance of this proposed deal. In practice, I believe that a successful transatlantic trade negotiation would establish global regulatory standards for business and trade on a transatlantic basis rather than the transatlantic powers having to copy others. Helen Goodman. Question number three, Mr Speaker. Minister of State. Mr Speaker, we publish details of ministerial meetings with external organisations on a quarterly basis, but in line with the practice of previous governments, we do not intend to publish a list of meetings between ministers and their departmental officials. Ellen Goodman. I'm grateful to the Minister for that answer. I wonder if he could tell the House whether, at the meeting the Foreign Office had on the 24th of February with Dmitry Firtash, the question of asset freezes or sanctions was discussed. Minister of State. Well, I'm obviously not going to go into details of what may or may not have been discussed at a meeting, particularly one that I was not present. Um, but uh, I think that the <laughs> it remains the case that... Um, Foreign Office officials and Foreign Office ministers speak to people uh, of all types from many different parts of the world with a single objective in mind, which is how best to enhance the United Kingdom's understanding of global events and to uh, strengthen the United Kingdom's interest in world affairs. Mr. Ian Paisley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given the day that's in it, can the uh, Minister confirm if he has had any meetings with the Republic of Ireland's Foreign Minister about them entering the British Commonwealth? Oh. Mr. Um, not to my knowledge, uh, Mr. Speaker. I, we take the view that this is a matter for the Government of Ireland. Clearly, there are strong bonds of friendship and of history between the two countries, but I think it has to be a matter for the Irish people and the Irish government to decide about any relationship with the Commonwealth. Question four, please, Mr. Speaker. Of State. Um, Mr. Speaker, the Foreign Secretary and I regularly speak to our European count uh, counterparts about all aspects of EU reform, including the powers and competences of institutions. Ian Murray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Given that Lord Heseltine has now admitted that the Prime Minister's approach to Europe is based on 
narrow party interest rather than the British national interest. Yeah. Will the Minister at last, for the third time that I have asked him at this dispatch box, yeah. to tell us what his top policy priority is for repatriation from Europe? And what would mean, in terms of a result, that the government would then campaign to stay in the European Union? Our top policy priorities in European reform are to make the European Union more democratically accountable, make it more globally competitive, make it more flexible than it is today, to have a situation in which... Uh, arrangements are fair to Eurozone members and non-members and to ensure that power can flow in both directions between Brussels and member states. I would have hoped that those were the objectives that the party opposite would share, but it seems I am to be disappointed in the honour. Mr David Nuttall. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Does my right honourable friend agree that we should seek to repatriate control over social and employment legislation which was handed over to Brussels uh, by the last Labour government when they gave up our opt-out from the social chapter? I think that the, there are aspects of social and economic policy, such as the uh, working time directive, the application of which has harmed the interests of the United Kingdom, and we do indeed need to seek changes to those policies where we think that they make not just the United Kingdom, but the whole of Europe more competitive, uh, less competitive than we need to be. Steve Vaz. Speaker, there were no Foreign Office Ministers present during the debate yesterday on European matters, so would the Minister for Europe comment on the Presidency text which suggested that we would have to make a decision by June of this year as to what parts of the JHA opt-out we are going to opt into. Well, I did read the comments in yesterday's debate by my right honourable friend, the Home Secretary, and as she told the House then, she is engaged with uh, my right honourable friend, the Justice Secretary, in negotiations with other member states and with the European Commission. Those uh, talks are moving forward constructively. We hope for uh, agreement at the earliest possible date, but there is no sort of artificial deadline, save the one in the treaties, which is the, that of December this year. Mrs Caroline Spellman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Would my right honourable friend agree with me that the repatriation of powers under the Common Fisheries Policy has enabled important localisation of benefits for British fishermen and condemn UKIP that voted against the iniquitous practice of fish discards? I think that the ban on the obscene practice of discarding and the shift of fisheries management back to local and regional level is uh, a real achievement for United Kingdom MEPs working with colleagues from other countries and with the European Commissioner concerned. It is disappointing if some UK MEPs felt that there were more important calls on their time than to defend British fishing interests in the way that our MEPs did. Gareth Thomas. The Prime Minister promised us all, Mr Speaker, that EU treaty change would happen by 2017 and that a major repatriation of powers would follow. Given that the French, the Germans and the Italians now have all confirmed that this isn't their priority, could this be why the Right Honourable Gentleman for Halton Price and Howden thinks that the Prime Minister has made such a mess of winning back powers from the European Union? Oh, dear, dear, dear. Um, uh, Mr Speaker, um, you know, I'm actually heartened by the strong support in Denmark and the Netherlands for our ideas on strengthening the role of national parliaments in the European Union, for the words in the German coalition agreement about the need for treaty changes in the future, for the practical achievements in repatriation of powers, whether through fisheries or the arrangements for double voting on the single supervisory mechanism. What I think the British people are waiting to hear is whether the opposition is prepared to trust the British people with the final decision on our membership of the European Union. Nara Ali. Minister Robertson. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Foreign Office addresses freedom of religion or belief across the world through our bilateral relationships, through multilateral organisations such as the United Nations, and through the Foreign Secretary's Human Rights Advisory Group. Roshnara Ali. 
I thank the Minister for his answer. Rohingya Muslims in Rakhine State are facing discrimination and a protracted humanitarian crisis compounded by the failure of the Burmese <coughs> government to recognise their right to citizenship. What action is the Minister taking to prevent the Burmese government from using its census, which receives some 10 million of UK assistance, to, dis to prevent discrimination against Rohingya Muslims by refusing to recognise their religious and ethnic identity? Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, well, the, the point that the Honourable Lady makes is well made. Um, my friend, the Minister of State, expressed our strong concerns about conditions there during his visit to Burma in January. He called in the Minister, Kin Yi, on the 26th of March and summoned the Burmese Ambassador only yesterday to make these representations. Mr. Peter Bowen. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the, in the Middle East, with the exception of Israel, where there is a lot of freedom of religion, and I think the Christian community is increased by 1,000% since the State of Israel came into being. But in the rest of the Middle East, there's a lack of freedom of religion. What is the government attempting to do to resolve that? Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and not least in response to concerns uh, expressed across the House through the Foreign Officers' mailbag and at Question Times, uh, we have made a priority of going to visit uh, religious leaders across the Middle East during visits. Um, recently I've seen the Copts in Egypt, I saw the Catholic community uh, in Jordan and called in at the Holy See uh, when I was in Rome for the Libya conference to speak to them about their concerns. Tom Greatrix. Thank you Mr Speaker. I'm sure the Minister is aware that the erosion of freedom of religious practice is an issue in a number of Commonwealth countries including Malaysia where the Malay word for God has effectively been banned making the Bible illegal and in Brunei where the introduction of uh, Sharia law has caused huge anxiety amongst the sizable Filipino Catholic community there. Could I ask the Minister to ensure that these issues are raised also, as well as the other forums he, he referred to, through the Commonwealth forums as well, to ensure that there is real freedom of religion in, in the Commonwealth countries? Uh, Mr Speaker, um, I, I can absolutely give him that assurance. Indeed, the Minister responsible for the Commonwealth has just said he, he got that message very clearly. Uh, just to be absolutely clear about this, when I mentioned the multilateral institutions, I couldn't list them all, but clearly the Commonwealth is absolutely keen to that. Well, Blackman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the last 50 years, the Jewish population in the Middle East, in Arab countries, has shrunk by 836,000 people who are all refugees. At the same time, there are some 836,000 Palestinian refugees. What is my right honourable friend's reaction to the fact that more than $2 billion has been spent supporting the Palestinian refugees, but zero on Israeli refugees? Minister. Uh, Mr Speaker, well, our, our allocations are driven by need in this area, and, and uh, I thank him for the various pieces of literature that he's provided to me, which I will follow up separately. Uh, but there, there is a very straightforward assessment of, of need. Actually, if you look at the situation of refugees, not only Jewish, not only Palestinian, uh, across the Middle East, particularly in Jordan and Lebanon, and it is worth reminding uh, the House that we have these questions at a time when the millionth Syrian refugee has arrived in Beirut. That is something we are addressing as a problem. Douglas Alexander. Mr Speaker, as we approach Easter, we know that millions of Christians across the world will be prevented from celebrating or will risk persecution for doing so. New research by Pew, the Pew Centre suggests that persecution of people who practice their religion increased in almost every major region of the world in recent years. In light of these very concerning reports, what specific steps is the UK Government taking as part of the UK Human Rights Council to ensure the tackling of the persecution of Christians and promoting freedom of religion is a key priority for the Council during the United Kingdom's membership? Uh, Mr Speaker, well, it's, it's a good question, and, and as I said in my initial answer to the, to the question, uh, the Foreign Office picks us up through bilateral, our bilateral relationships with the countries concerned, through the multilateral institutions, and through the Foreign Secretary's Human Rights Advisory Group. Uh, this will be an issue that we will concentrate on over, this, over the period. The reaction we've had across the House and from those with whom we've had contact indicates that this is a, is a serious issue, and it's one that we will take seriously. Dominic Raab. Number six, sir. Mr Stay. Mr. Speaker, the United uh, Nations Commission of Inquiry report on human rights in DPRK documented appalling human rights violations. The UK played a leading role in ensuring a strong UN Human Rights Council resolution on the issue, which made clear that there can be no impunity for those responsible. Morning, Rob. Thank the Minister for that answer. The report uh, <coughs> documented a totalitarian state on a par with Nazi Germany systematically starving, torturing, murdering its own people. And in reply, North Korea, backed by China, told the international community to mind its own business. 
How do we tilt the balance of China's perception of its national interests so it stops protecting the war criminals in Pyongyang? Mr. State. Indeed, my honourable friend is right. The uh, Human Rights Council resolution talked about state sanctioned horrific violations, which they described as without parallel in the contemporary world. Uh, It's worth saying that my right honourable friend at the UK China Strategic Dialogue, my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, raised the COI report with State Councillor Yang, and we continue to discuss human rights abuses in the DPRK uh, with the Chinese and, indeed, other parties. North Korea's periodic review at the United Nations is due on the 1st of May. Will the government take that chance to highlight the fact that 25% of Christians are incarcerated in North Korea and also highlight the repatriation of people from China to North Korea who they are treated very badly? Well, it's absolutely right that this House should be concerned about the freedom to practice Christianity in the run-up to Easter and the stories of uh, persecutions of Christians uh, within DPRK, which are included in this report, are truly uh, shocking. In terms of uh, refoulement, which is what he referred to in the second part of his question, that is also something we have been discussing with the Chinese. Uh, The jailing of uh, of, uh, parents in North Korea, many who are Christians, leaving their children abandoned, confused, frightened and left to starve to death. Has the Minister had any discussions or able to have any discussions with the North Korean ambassador or indeed with the Chinese authorities who could add influence to that to see if they can improve their circumstances? Uh, The threat uh, in North Korea uh, is unfortunately not just to uh, the Christian community, it is to the people uh, of that country. Uh, The threat comes from their own government. Uh, We are, as I've just said, extremely concerned about the persecution uh, of uh, Christians as well as other minorities. At the end of the day, uh, the world is watching a DPRK. We need to assemble all the evidence because I believe that one day uh, this appalling regime will be held to account. Mrs Sharon Hodgson. Question 7, Mr Speaker. The UK is committed to combating violence and discrimination wherever it occurs. FCO ministers have recently raised LGBT issues with the governments of Nigeria, Russia, India and Uganda. We used our 2013 chairmanship of the Council of Europe to reform legislation in Europe and at the UN we have raised concerns about several other countries. Sharon Hodgson. There's real concern across the House that the the government's response to Uganda's Anti-Homosexuality Act has been too weak. This dreadful violation of human rights needs a strong international response, both to send a clear message to Uganda as well as to other countries contemplating similar legislation. Will the Secretary of State therefore accept that quiet diplomacy is just not enough and it's now time for targeted travel bans and meaningful sanctions as a real statement that the UK will not tolerate such abuse? Uh, Well, I've spent a good deal of time studying this issue, which I regard as very important. And I think, first of all, it's very important for us to encourage a long-term change in attitudes. In Uganda, we support training, advocacy, and legal cases related to the protection of LGBT rights. We fund a project by the Kaleidoscope Trust. I met the leading Ugandan LGBT human rights activist myself, Dr. Frank Mugisha, to illustrate the importance we attach to this. Uh, But I judge that uh, if we were to implement sanctions or other measures, uh, then we would be penalizing poor people who benefit from our development aid, uh, or we could produce a counterproductive response in other African countries. It is a difficult judgment, but that's what I consider to be the right approach. Naomi Long. There is anecdotal evidence that since the passing of the law, there has also been an increase in persecution and attacks on Ugandans who are homosexual. Can the Secretary of State confirm that he has had, if he has had any discussions with the Home Office regarding what approach they will take to those who seek refuge from persecution? Uh, well, the Home Office, of course, um, apply uh, strictly and properly. Uh, criteria for accepting people in, as as, uh, asylum seekers uh, into this country who are vulnerable to persecution. And that, of course, uh, can be people persecuted or at risk of discrimination, violence uh, on grounds of uh, LGBT uh, activism. Um, and so this is an important criterion for them. Mr. Barry Chairman. No, Mr. Speaker. Mr. State. Mr. Speaker, my right honourable friend, the Chancellor, rapidly becoming one of the greatest uh, Chancellors in modern times, is in, uh, is in Brazil uh, this very week, the 14th 
the 14th Government Minister to visit in the last 12 months. Yesterday he announced a further £4 million worth of funding for UKTI to support 3,000 exporters and to expand its operations to Latin America, as well as the special Bank of England facility to support lending. But, Mr Speaker, we still lag behind Germany, France and Italy in terms of the uh, strength of our trading partnership with Brazil. And although the Brazilian economy is going through a tough time, is there any update on the bilateral tax treaty that we were pursuing? Is that part of the Chancellor's visit? And when are we going to redouble our efforts to export to this important destination? Well, I'm sure that the Chancellor will be discussing all matters of interest to the UK economy and the City of London, of course, taxation being one of those, double taxation being one of those issues. I have to say uh, to the uh, Honourable Gentleman, uh, who was part of a government uh, who for 13 years had responsibility for Britain's exports and relations with Brazil, uh, in, in the last 12 months alone, there have been 14 ministerial visits uh, to Brazil. That level of commitment was not matched virtually in the entire period, in the entire period of, of Labour's uh, maladministration. Be grateful to the Minister of State. To be fair to the Honourable Member for Huddersfield, he wasn't part of that government. He was a proud backbench supporter of it. Which, ah, an important distinction I think the Honourable Gentleman would readily concede. Mr Philip Hollibane. Uh, Brazil is the leading economic and political power in South America. How successful are we being in persuading the Brazilians of the merits of the Falkland Islanders' case that their sovereignty should be decided by the Falkland Islanders themselves and not by their Argentine neighbours? Well, I hope that laughter was about something else, because this is a very serious... Perhaps it wasn't, um, but, uh, because this is a very serious matter. Uh, when we go uh, around uh, Latin America and, indeed, Central America, we are always uh, absolutely certain to make the case that the Falkland Islanders... Uh, have had uh, a referendum in which they expressly desired uh, their, their desire overwhelmingly uh, to maintain their current status. This is something that should be recognised by countries right across the world if you believe in self-determination and human rights, not only in Latin America, but of course there are some countries in Latin America, one in particular unfortunately, which continues to bully and to intimidate uh, the Falkland Islanders. Ian Collins. Number 10, Mr Speaker. One secretary. Bosnians are deeply frustrated by the failure of political leaders to deliver on any of the issues that matter. During my visit ten days ago to Bosnia, I urged Bosnia's leaders to respond to protesters' legitimate demands and to avoid ethnic and secessionist rhetoric. The redrawing of borders in the Balkans is finished. Mr. Um, the challenge of Bosnia continues to be exacerbated by secessionist voices within the entity of Republika Srpska. Uh, does the Foreign Secretary agree with me that Europe and the United States must address this threat to the stability of Bosnia and that the international community must be prepared to sanction those responsible for these calls? Uh, well, certainly uh, the international community must uh, address these issues. Um, we will be discussing them at the uh, European Union Foreign Affairs Council in Luxembourg next Monday. Um, and I believe that it will be vital after the elections take place in Bosnia-Herzegovina in October uh, for there to be a major international effort to ensure that a functioning state is created uh, in Bosnia-Herzegovina, and that is something that is not happening at the moment. Thanks, Robertson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is the first opportunity I've had to uh, put on the record uh, the sadness of the passing of Margaret MacDonald, the former SNP member of Glasgow Govan, and I'm sure there are members uh, on both sides of the House that would wish to pass on their condolences to Jim Sillers himself, a former member for Glasgow Govan and the extended family. Uh, on Bosnia, uh, the, Secretary of, uh, the, the Foreign Secretary is aware that Croatian Bosnians are able to uh, access and have passports from the Republic of Croatia, that soon Bosnian Serbs will be able to have Serbian European Union passports, and the one, the one group of citizens in Bosnia-Herzegovina that will not be able to have European Union passports are the Bosniaks themselves. What can the Secretary of State do to ensure a European perspective for all citizens of Bosnia-Herzegovina? <coughs> Um, well, I join in the uh, tribute uh, to the passing of Margot MacDonald and, I, uh, and, and to a, a strong record in this House in the past. Um, and on the very important question of what happens to, to the whole population of Bosnia-Herzegovina, uh, this, uh, this is something I uh, spoke about to other EU foreign ministers, including those from 
uh, candidate countries of the EU on Saturday, stressing the very point that he has just been making, uh, and that an unstable Bosnia threatens the stability of the whole of the Western Balkans. Uh, that is why we have to make sure there is a functioning state in that country in the coming years. Mr. Ian Lucas. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> I've discussed progress uh, in the last few days. I've discussed progress with Secretary Kerry and with President Abbas, and I will speak to my Israeli counterparts in the coming days. Secretary Kerry's tireless efforts provide an unparalleled opportunity to achieve a two state solution, and I urge both parties to show the bold leadership needed to resolve this conflict once and for all. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I certainly welcome uh, the information provided by the Foreign Secretary today, but he will be aware of press stories that the latest report by the European Heads of Mission in East Jerusalem um, has stated that Israeli policies in Jerusalem are aimed at cementing its unilateral and illegal annexation of East Jerusalem with an unprecedented surge in settlement activity. Does the Foreign Secretary concur with their views? And if so, what is he doing to ensure that the future of Jerusalem as a shared capital will remain as part of these negotiations? Hmm. Well, Jerusalem as a shared capital is um, part of what we uh, believe is, is a characteristic of achieving a two-state solution, al along with a solution uh, based on 1967 borders with agreed uh, land swaps uh, and with a just, fair and agreed settlement for refugees. It's vital that possibility is kept open, uh, which is why so many of us in this House on all sides have voiced such strong disapproval of settlements on occupied land, uh, which are illegal, uh, and that is a point that we make regularly to the Israelis. Indeed, I will be doing so to an Israeli Minister this afternoon. We urge them to take the opportunity of peace. Oh, Mr. Speaker, in December last year, the Foreign Secretary said that the British government was clear to the Palestinians that there is no alternative to the negotiations and that we oppose unilateral measures. What representation has he made to the PA following its return to unilateral actions last week in violation of its commitment to abstain for the duration of direct peace talks? Uh, well, I called President Abbas uh, on Thursday uh, last week to uh, repeat our view that uh, the only chance of a viable uh, Palestinian state and sovereign Palestinian state is to achieve it through negotiations. Uh, the, uh, President Abbas uh, assured me that he remains committed uh, to negotiations, and so we will continue to encourage him and Israeli leaders to make a success, even at this stage, of this opportunity. Mrs. Louise Elman. Speaker, um, I think it is essential that both sides return to negotiations and that they both recognise that great compromises will have to be made by both to, to secure a negotiated peace. But does the Foreign Secretary believe that the Palestinian leadership has been preparing the Palestinians for peace when terrorists freed by Israel have been welcomed in the Palestinian Authority as heroes? And this includes a broadcast by PATV, which honoured Dalal Mugrabi, who was responsible for a hijacking where 37 Israeli citizens, including 12 children, were killed. Um, prisoner releases are always controversial in a peace process, as, as we uh, know well in our own country. Um, but I, think, uh, I absolutely regard President Abbas, uh, the leader of the Palestinians, as a man of peace. And I pay tribute to the bold leadership that he has shown on these issues in recent months. As the Honourable Lady has just heard, I've urged him to continue with that. And I think that is the point we must focus on. Yeah. What is government policy on Palestine applying as a state to be a member of international political and cultural organisations? Uh, well, what has happened last week is that President Abbas signed and submitted letters of accession to 15 conventions, including the Fourth Geneva Convention. Uh, no decision is imminent or necessary, no, no decision is necessary at the moment uh, on these things. And given that our focus is on urging both Palestinians and Israelis to make a success of the negotiations, I don't believe it would be wise to, for us or other countries to pass judgment on those applications now. Mr. Andrew Love. Uh, number 13, Mr. Speaker. Mr. State. 
The 25th session of the UN Human Rights Council took strong action to combat impunity by voting through resolutions on Syria, DPRK and Sri Lanka in response to UN reporting on allegations of serious human rights violations. Can I focus on the international inquiry into the conflict in Sri Lanka? Given the Rajapaksa government's hostility, what mechanisms are available to the inquiry uh, to uh, carry out their investigation on the island, and what protections can they give to witnesses who will come before it, both of which are absolutely critical if we're to get to the bottom of events in 2009? The Honourable Gentleman is absolutely right. We got the resolution through that we wanted. The Prime Minister showed tremendous leadership on this. I think we were completely vindicated in our decision uh, to go to Chogham, and my right honourable friend, the Foreign Secretary, included. Had we not gone there, I do not believe we would be in the position we are in uh, today. It is now important, now that the international community has spoken through the United Nations uh, uh, Human Rights Council, that the government uh, are in Colombo, listen to what has been said, listen to what is being asked of them, and we can conduct an international investigation through the office of the UN High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights in order to make that country a better place for all. Uh, Will the Minister also uh, maintain the robust approach to human rights abuses in Tibet with the upcoming UK-China human rights dialogue and press the Chinese for a date for the visit to Tibet and China by the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, Navi Pile, to which China has agreed. Mr. Well, uh, we are looking forward, of course, to the uh, human rights dialogue uh, with the Chinese. That will be uh, a date uh, will be forthcoming shortly. It's worth saying, actually, that the, the new configuration of the Human Rights Council uh, is different. Uh, it is less prepared to support country mandates because, of course, also re-elected along with the United Kingdom were Russia, uh, China and Cuba. Despite the release of Sakina Ashtiani, there are many other women in Iran who face the death penalty in breach of their human rights. Could the Minister please raise their case and uphold their human rights? Uh, Human rights, to my way of thinking, are universal. Uh, where they are being uh, abrogated or violated. That needs to be drawn to the attention. I shall make sure that my right honourable friend uh, acts on this. David Mowat. And number 14, Mr Speaker. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, successive UK governments have not routinely negotiated with foreign governments over private compensation claims. However, the UK has on a number of occasions raised with the Libyan authorities the importance of engaging with UK victims seeking redress, including those seeking compensation through private campaigns and their legal representatives. I, I, I thank the uh, Minister for that answer. Uh, he will be aware that the American uh, victims uh, of, of Semtex bombings have received over £1 billion of compensation, whilst the 200 UK victims have so far received nothing. Can he give an assurance to the House? that there was no deal done in 2008 as part of the normalisation of relations with with Gaddafi to the detriment of my constituents. Uh, uh, Mr Speaker, uh, yes I can. I I, I think I should probably say to him that the the, the situation here is clearly very different to the United States because we have victims who have suffered across a wide range of means, not merely through Semtex, but I can absolutely Uh, assure him that the claim that government officials took any action that denied UK victims compensation in the 2008 bilateral agreement between the US and Libya is wrong. No, the Honourable Gentleman has already had one go. His appetite ought to have been satisfied for now. He seems to be a hungry caterpillar, but he'll have to wait. Never mind. Fiona Bruce. 15, Mr Speaker. Foreign Secretary. The UK's leading international efforts to help the estimated 4.1 million Syrian refugees in the region and six and a half million internationally, uh, internally displaced people. So far we've provided £241 million in life-saving support to civilians caught up in the conflict and allocated £292 million to help refugees and host communities in neighbouring countries. Fiona Bruce. I thank my right honourable friend for that reply. Is he concerned by reports from Open Doors that 3,000 Christians have fled their homes in Kessa, northern Syria, within the past few days? due to fighters of the Al-Nasra Front and ISIS entering northwest Syria from Turkey. Ethnic conflict is increasing there. <coughs> Aid cannot get through. Has he made representations to the relevant authorities about Turkey's porous borders? 
Uh, we're very concerned by reports of violence and people being displaced in Kesab. It's difficult to establish accurate numbers, um, but we are working closely with the Turkish government to restrict the ability of foreign fighters to cross into Syria, and that is something I've discussed recently with the Foreign Minister of Turkey. Included. It has been promised many times, but what progress is being made in gaining unimpeded humanitarian access in Syria itself? Well, very little progress has been made. Despite the successful passing of UN Security Council Resolution 2139, which included the authorization of cross-border uh, access, uh, the Security Council is due to review the position every 30 days, and at the coming review, uh, we will press very strongly for full use to be made of what is authorized in that resolution. Order. Topical questions, Mr. Robert Buckland. Yeah, yeah. Number two, sir. Foreign Secretary. Uh, Mr. Speaker, yesterday I attended the commemoration in Rwanda of the 20th anniversary of the genocide, and today I will join in welcoming the President of the Irish Republic on his historic state visit. Mr. Robert Buckland. I thank my right honourable friend for that reply. Does my right honourable friend welcome robust political engagement with European politicians like uh, Martin Schulz, the Socialist President of the European Parliament? Or will he be on his knees begging him not to come to the UK during the European parliamentary campaign, like the party opposite? <laughs> um, I think robust political engagement is definitely the option to take um, on that, but there is uh, nothing robust about being in alliance with other parties where you're ashamed to see their leader and candidate come to this country. Harry McCarthy. I... I welcome the Human Rights Council resolution on Sri Lanka, but given that President Rajapaksa has failed to comply with previous resolutions, failed to comply with the very generous last chance offer that the Prime Minister gave him at Chogham, and now his outright rejection of this resolution, does the Foreign Secretary still think it's appropriate for him to continue as Chair in Office of the Commonwealth? And if this is referred to the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, what position will the UK take? Um, well, the UK is not on the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group, as she knows, nor is it in our gift to determine the uh, chair of the Commonwealth ourselves. Uh, but it was within our gift to decide to go to yeah. Sri Lanka and to raise these right. issues. And as my right hon. friend has just made very clear, there would have been no chance of succeeding in the Human Rights Council, as we did recently on this, had it not been for the Prime Minister's leadership, our presence in Sri Lanka, yeah, yeah. our willingness to uh, show how how passionate we were about what, was, what had happened in the north of Sri Lanka. The attitude of the opposition of not going to Sri Lanka at all would have been a terrible misjudgment. Dr. Philip Lee. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I was pleased to read recently in a, a recent report by the Foreign Affairs Select Committee that the government has been developing a strategy, a strategy towards the Gulf. In view of the obvious complexities of the Middle East, does the Foreign Secretary agree with me that there's a very good case now to open up this approach to a broader regional strategy? Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, absolutely we do. The, the strategy on the Gulf has been developed over a number of years, is already paying uh, benefits not only diplomatically but economically, commercially across a wide range of areas. Uh, and it has been such a success that there are many other people looking to establish such a relationship with us. Naomi Long. Has the Secretary of State received any recent reports of the conditions of the seven Baha'i leaders who are approaching now the sixth anniversary of their incarceration in Iran? And will he take this opportunity to call again for their release? Um, Mr. Speaker, ye uh, yes, we will. Uh, as the Honourable Lady is aware, there is a process, a gradual and staged process, of unfreezing relationships with the Iranian government. Um, we haven't directly addressed that issue personally at ministerial level, um, but it is one of the issues that we'll be, we will be taking up as we move that relationship forward. Andrew Bridgen, not here. Mr. Peter Bone. M Mr. Speaker, um, what is the Foreign Secretary's view um, in relation to the bizarre situation that this country pays overseas aid to the Palestinian Authority, which then uses it to pay salaries to the family of convicted terrorists in Israel? Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Speaker, um, as the Foreign Secretary has made clear, um, actually at the moment our, the entire and sole focus of our policy over Israel and the occupied Palestinian territories has to be 
to get behind the peace process being led by John Kerry. Uh, once, you know, should, um, one, once that process has been uh, concluded, I hope successfully, uh, then there will be an opportunity to look, at a fresh, look afresh at all these issues. Anne McKechin. Mr Speaker, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in a recent report on Colombia has again emphasised his concerns on human rights. Yep. Uh, can the Minister confirm what dis- recent discussions he has had with the Government of Colombia <laughs> about protecting the safety of human rights defenders and trade unionists. Minister of State. Uh, Human rights continue to be a very important part of our relationship uh, with Colombia. Human rights were discussed with President Santos and Defence Minister Pinzon during the Foreign Foreign Secretary's visit to Colombia in February. And at that time, he also met with a range of NGOs who work in the human rights field and also hosted a high-profile event on sexual violence in conflict. The Honourable Lady will want to be aware that we are also publishing our annual human rights report on Thursday. Paul Maynard. Since independence in 1991, the Ukraine has had a number of elections which has often been called into question by the various participants. It's crucial this does not reoccur. What help and support is the UK giving to the Government of Ukraine to make sure these elections truly are free and fair? Uh, Well, I've made this very point uh, very strongly to Ukrainian leaders that it is important uh, that the elections that take place on May the 25th are well observed internationally and are accepted as fully free and fair and that that includes uh, accepting the recommendations that have been made by observers from previous uh, elections. I believe the Ukrainians have the uh, resources to uh, do that, uh, so our efforts will be focused uh, on uh, ensuring good observation and trying to ensure good procedures. Stella Creasy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Foreign Secretary has talked proudly of his Preventing Sexual Violence and Conflict Initiative and the summit in June. Given the concerns that many of us have about what is happening there, does he believe that the Sri Lankan government will attend and what action will he take if they don't? Um, Well, of course, I'm not able to uh, compel any government to attend. Um, I've invited the 143 nations that so far have endorsed the uh, declaration that I launched on ending sexual violence to attend the summit in June. I can't force any of them to do so, but it would be highly appropriate, given events in Sri Lanka in recent decades, uh, for them to be there and to present their plans, and I have encouraged them to do so. Martin Orwood. As a unique financial hub, we have the power to inflict more painful sanctions on Russians not just involved in assisting intervention in Ukraine, but on the wealthy friends and backers of Vladimir Putin. We also have a unique responsibility as the European guarantor of the Budapest Memorandum, which should have protected Ukraine from Russian aggression. If Russia further violates Ukrainian sovereignty, shouldn't we use that power to uphold that responsibility? Um, The the Budapest Memorandum of 1994 doesn't give us a specific power other than to call for consultations with the other signatories, and while we and Ukraine and the United States have done that, Russia has refused to join in those consultations. Uh, But the European Commission has been asked to prepare more far-reaching measures, which, as the Prime Minister has said, uh, cover economic, financial and trade areas. It is now doing that work. And we will be in favour of such far-reaching measures if Russia deliberately uh, continues and, and deliberately escalates the situation in Ukraine. Diana Johnson. Mr Speaker, Greenpeace's campaign against Procter G- Gamble's use of palm oil reports say this is being sourced from companies uh, contributing to the deforestation in Indonesia, endangering the habitats of Sumatran tigers, elephants and orangutans. Given that the Minister of State is the government's strategic relations manager for Procter & Gamble, can he tell us what discussions he's had with Procter & Gamble in relation to this and whether this would be endorsed under the government's action plan on business and human rights? Uh, I can confirm that I I have had no such discussions uh, to date with Procter & Gamble. If the Honourable Lady would like to meet with me to discuss her concerns in greater detail, uh, I'm sure that I will prove a useful conduit for her concerns. And McIntosh. Following the successful renegotiation of fisheries policies back to regional control, will the government use its good offices to make sure that the government can decide which greening measures are dictated by uh, this country rather than from EU? Um, my right hon. Honourable friends in uh, DEFRA 
always have in mind in the application of European rules how they can secure the best possible opportunities for this country's agriculture, and they will continue to do so. Cathy Jameson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister give us an update on the political situation in Venezuela and what prospects he sees for dialogue and an end to violence? And can he also say what action the UK Government is taking in relation to that? Yes, uh, we are um, uh, extremely concerned about the situation in Venezuela. Uh, in my statement of the 26th of March, I urged all sides to take steps to avoid confrontation, reduce tensions and create the right conditions for genuine dialogue. A Commission of Foreign Ministers, Mr Speaker, from the UNISOR group of countries is on its second visit to Venezuela as we speak. Uh, they are going to support and advise on dialogue between the parties. We hope this can play a positive role in help, helping to avoid violence and promote reconciliation in Venezuela. Can the Foreign Secretary tell the House what discussions he's had about the situation in Ukraine with his counterparts in other countries in the former Soviet Union, but outside the EU, such as Azerbaijan and Kazakhstan, to understand their perspectives and their concerns as he develops his thinking in this area? Foreign Secretary. Um, well, we've had many discussions at many different levels uh, with those countries, and I think it was significant that when it came to the vote of the UN General Assembly on, the, on what has happened in Crimea, and only 11 countries in the world uh, supported the Russian position, uh, even many of the countries of the Commonwealth of Independent States were not able to support the Russian, not willing to support the Russian position. And that is an illustration of Russia's diplomatic isolation on this issue. Stephen Pound. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The long suffering Christian communities of Kesab was mentioned earlier on. The Foreign Secretary will be aware that this community is predominantly of Armenian origin, facing the 100th anniversary of the last Armenian genocide. May I tell the Foreign Secretary that many Armenian constituents of mine are convinced that Turkey is facilitating, or at least not preventing, the cross-border attacks and atrocities. Will he undertake to raise this with his uh, opposite member? Um, well, as I said to my honourable friend earlier, we're very concerned about uh, what has happened, particularly in recent days, in that part of Syria. Uh, we do, in any case, um, raise with Turkey the importance of uh, doing everything possible to stop the flow of foreign fighters into Syria. And uh, given the concern in this House, of course, it is a point we will raise further and again uh, with the Turkish government. Mm. Mark Reckless. Uh, following the Minister of Europe's visit to Georgia last week, does he now discern a pattern of prosecutorial intimidation of opposition politicians? And does he share my extreme concern that the highly respected Giga Bukaria was called, hauled in by prosecutors on Friday? Um, in the conversations I had with the Prime Minister and other ministers while I was in Georgia last week, I did repeat very clearly that it is in Georgia's interest, as well as the expectation of the United Kingdom and Georgia's other friends, that while no one should be exempt from due process, um, that we should avoid uh, any appearance or risk of selective justice of the kind that we saw under the previous regime in Ukraine. Eggman. Once again, there has been very little discussion today of the situation in Syria. Yet the conflict continues, thousands are being killed, millions are being displaced. What is this government and the international community doing to stop this dreadful conflict? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, the Honourable Lady is, uh, is quite right, and it, is, it remains uh, the single most uh, serious crisis in international affairs, even by comparison with all the others that we have discussed. Uh, the international community has failed so far to resolve this conflict. Uh, we remain in favour of a third round of the Geneva talks, but that requires greater flexibility on the part of the regime as to what they will negotiate. In the absence of such progress, our focus is on humanitarian assistance to the millions of people uh, displaced, and on that the United Kingdom plays a leading role in the world. Mr. Duncan Haynes. Mr. Speaker, the Foreign Secretary will have heard the findings of the latest IPCC report on the impact of climate change. What diplomatic initiatives is his department taking to broker international agreement to cut global carbon emissions? 
Foreign Secretary. Uh, the United Kingdom is one of the most active countries in the world diplomatically uh, on promoting global binding agreement on addressing climate change. Uh, the IPCC report underlines the extreme urgency uh, of this. I regularly discuss with Secretary Kerry what we can do with the U.S. administration to push forward international agreement, and we will remain very, very active on this issue. Thank you, Davis. Uh, 15,000 jobs in the UK rely on employment in Ford's Dagenham and Ford's Bridgend, close to my constituency. What does he then make of the comments of Steve O'Dell, the Chief of European Operations Ford's, who says, I don't want to threaten the British government, but, and it's a big but, I would strongly advise against leaving the EU for business and employment purposes in the UK. Um, uh, Mr O'Dell, like many other Uh, business leaders in this country has been very clear about the economic uh, risks that would be taken were the United Kingdom to leave the European Union. That no doubt will be one of the chief arguments in the debate at the referendum that my right honourable friend the Prime Minister has has promised. At the end of the day it should be for the people to decide having taken into account all arguments both for and against membership. Order. I'm sorry, but demand exceeds supply as usual. 